If you are reading along today with the printed sermon, I um, took some inspiration from our Old Testament forefather of Jacob who wrestled all night long with God. And I wrestled with Koheleth all night long. And so it looks a little different what is in the printed version out there, but well, still there. I close my eyes only for a moment and the moment is gone. All my dreams pass before my eyes, a curiosity. Dust in the wind, all they are is dust in the wind. The lyrics to Kansas' hit, Dust in the Wind, sounds as though it could be part of the book of Ecclesiastes, or at least the authors could be friends. We begin at Stump the Preacher by taking a look at Ecclesiastes this week and next, written by an author full of questions wrestling with the dust in the wind. We might say that the author has a chip on his shoulder or is in need of an attitude adjustment. Or maybe this guy is just brutally honest about how he sees the world. And maybe that resonates with us. Perhaps it furthers our own cynicism or perhaps it creates dissonance. He can't be right, right? The title of this book points us to the author. It's a teacher of an assembly who writes, this Greek word means the church, so this is a teacher in a church. This teacher has doubts and complaints and questions about the uncertainty in life, while they are certain of one thing, that everything is vanity. The word vanity, kebel in Hebrew, is actually a metaphor, so it always gets a little lost in the translation. So when you look at different Bible translations, it always says something different. Here are a few. Uh, you'll find chasing the wind, useless, vapor. Two of my favorites are the message, which says it's spitting into the wind. And the common English Bible says definitely everything is pointless, just wind chasing. For today, I will translate vanity the way that my seminary professor did, Dr. Ballantyne, when he taught Ecclesiastes. He, instead of vanity, used perfectly pointless. Everything under the sun is perfectly pointless. We engage the teacher today towards the end of chapter 2 of 12. He's mid-discourse on all the way he's tried to create meaning in his life. He's tried building things, owning slaves. He's piled up gold and silver, accumulating wealth. He's hired people to entertain him, both as musicians and people in his bed. And in his own words, he gave in to every impulse. And at the end of it all, all of these actions and impulses have been perfectly pointless. We pick up in verse 17, in which he says he hates his life. His toiling is worthless, for he doesn't decide who reaps the rewards. And so he wonders, who will those people be? Who knows, he retorts. But the teacher knows that it's God who knows. God knows who will benefit from the teacher's work and whether they will be foolish or wise. That's not up to the teacher, and that's exactly why it irks them so. All the toiling, if it's not up to us, must be perfectly pointless. The teacher, disillusioned with life, turns to despair. They've tried to be wise their whole life, and yet has it mattered? Both the foolish and the wise meet their fate in death. The teacher has witnessed a world in which everything was a commodity to be bought or sold. And yet, what good does buying and selling do? In their viewpoint, God is the one who gives and takes away, and there are no guarantees. So despair feels like the only thing that can be certain in life. I'm reminded of Amy, one of the March sisters in Little Women. She is a painter. She spent ages perfecting the art of painting flowers. And after finishing a masterpiece, she puts down her paintbrush and she steps back. She sees the easel of those around her and she discovers they've moved on. They're all painting in Impressionism. In that moment, she realizes she'll never catch up I imagine that's the teacher in his rambling thoughts collected in Ecclesiastes. He'll never catch up. There will always be toiling. So he turns to despair, 
which is certainly one option in the face of recognizing what he views as a perfectly pointless nature of an uncertain life. The teacher's honesty, though, can serve as a mirror for us, inviting us to apply his questioning to our own lives when it comes to our markers of wisdom and success. We're told that wisdom and success is working the hardest and earning the most money, staying late at the office, purchasing the right thing that will make everything easier. And so it all just piles on as we toil away, scrolling our way through the internet, seeing others who seem like they have it all figured out and we're all just still miserable. But eventually, in all of that toiling, we also come to the question this author has. Isn't this all perfectly pointless? What is the good life in this? Ecclesiastes is really cheery if you haven't picked up on it yet. <laughs> and its hopeless tone totally matches the rest of our scripture. There was actually a lot of hubbub around why Ecclesiastes wound up in the Bible that we have today, but it's here. And so, it's also critical to engage with this text and also realize that in the middle of this book, there's more to the teacher's words than that which is all perfectly pointless. The author has mixed feelings about life, and somehow I feel like that can resonate with all of us. Our reading today holds a shift. There is nothing better for mortal than to eat, drink, and find enjoyment in their toil. This also I saw is from the hand of God. For apart from God, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? In the face of the realities of a tenuous and transitory human experience, and in the face of a mysterious and unknowable God, there comes this call to eat and drink and to be merry as an alternative way to get on with life with a lot less despair. With all that happens under the sun, the same fate awaits. There's no winning. There's no way out of this life without scars or bruises and pain, and nobody leaves alive. One way to read Ecclesiastes is as a cautionary tale. The ramblings of an old man who really realizes far, far too late in life that nothing we can do matters one iota. We are dust, and to dust we shall return. But because he realizes this so late, he only has time left for despair, and little time to realize the comforts of God's sovereignty, God's authority and control, and the beauty of existence in this way with all of its bumps and bruises. Instead of despair, in the midst of toiling, there is also the possibility, the possibility for being as present as you can be in whatever moment you're called to. That's the gift from God. As a teacher puts it, eat, drink, and be merry, for this is also from the hand of God. As the Message Bible puts it, the best you can do with your life is have a good time and get by the best you can. The way I see it, that's it, divine fate. Whether we feast or fast, it's up to God. While this text is rare to make appearances in church, it does exist within the lectionary, and it's read during the season of ordinary time. Ordinary time doesn't hold any big holy days like Christmas or Easter. It's the part of the year, the other part of the year. It's this in-between time in which we have to intentionally watch for the center of our life, God, without the holy days reminding us where God is. And Christmas, we see God is with us, and Easter, God is for us, Pentecost, God is in us as the Spirit. But here we are in ordinary time, with the same question as the teacher. How do we experience God in the ordinary, in all the toiling under the sun? Well, we don't go too far into self-indulgence. The teacher has already showed us that that does not work. We also don't just throw our hands up and say nothing we do matters. 
as the teacher in Ecclesiastes is just one voice within all of scripture, and many other voices tell us otherwise, including Jesus, who you know, is really big on loving your enemies and loving your neighbors as a starter. And yet, Ecclesiastes also offers us some guidance as disciples. We need not get caught up in the many things in life that do not matter, but instead we can get caught up in the things that do matter. For the teacher, that's the experience of God amidst the ordinary. The short moments in this scripture where you see the eating and drinking and merriment and relationship with others that's peppered throughout the book. As we have moved past the Easter season, we're now in ordinary time liturgically, and the summer feels a lot closer to ordinary time than the last one did. And with that, we're tasked with continuing to pay attention to being present in the moment we're in so we may find God within it and delight. Of course, we could shift right back to the way things used to be, but often in that busyness, we would miss God. The teacher with their rhetorical, who knows, peppered throughout this book, reminds us that it's God who knows. We can't confine God to the boxes of wisdom and righteousness and success that we create. Instead, we can be open to noticing God's wisdom and righteousness as it is, always appearing differently than what we believe it should, as it has in the ages past and it will in the ages to come. Perhaps we can begin by honestly appraising life as it is, the bumps and the bruises and the toiling, but may we also enjoy it seeing God in the eating and the drinking and the merriment in every day, and recognizing that this is a faithful task for us too. Amen.